Okay, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, if you will, please. Hebrews 12. I suspect Pastor Kim will go a little bit longer because we took extra time, I think, from extra, some extra music, and Brother Josh presented his missionary challenge and appreciated that, too. Amen. Um, the piranhas need someone to witness to them, too. <laughs> I, heard there's a, I heard someplace along the Amazon there's a zip line you can go through, and I don't know where that, where that oh. is. Make sure that cable doesn't drop. Doesn't drop. Man. <laughs> you want to fall in the pool? Doesn't drop the ball. It's not bad. It's slamming. <laughs> okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. We've spent three to four weeks in this chapter. I want to finish it today. Read verses 25 to 29, if you will, please. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not, who refused him that spake on earth. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth, but only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> Verse 25, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Well, the one who speaketh um, shed the blood that also speaketh. We talked about that last week, up in verse 24. Um, concluding, For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, Notice the match to that question back in chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's a great question. Everybody ought to ask themselves that question sometime in their life. And the uh, references are to God uh, on this earth at Mount Sinai, speaking to the Israelites through Moses. A lot of people would forget that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt... Moses was the highest authority on this earth at the time. He spoke for God. In fact, God told Moses he would be as a God to Pharaoh. Anything God had to say to Pharaoh, he'd say it through Moses. Notice chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2 once more. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24, verse 27 tells us. And our text continues, verse 25, Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Verse 26, Whose voice then shook the earth. That was Moses on Mount Sinai. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The popular commentaries <clears throat> teach that Christ speaking from heaven is merely a an inspirational phrase. It's a writer's way of describing the warnings, the admonitions you get from the Bible, and the scriptures convey to the world, um, or it includes the inner voice of inspiration that comes from the Holy Spirit that a believer receives knowing Jesus Christ, knowing that he's saved. Um, and to the commentators and modern preachers, it's all figurative. And none of the Bible is to be taken uh, word for word, literally. And despite the fact that the Bible tells us that God spoke from heaven to the Apostle John. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I heard a voice from heaven saying, come up hither. And I'm waiting to hear that voice as well. Amen. One of these days you and I are going to hear a voice from heaven yelling, come up hither. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. Amen. But um, <clears throat> despite the fact that God spoke from heaven to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4, verse 31. And despite the fact that God spoke to Peter, James, and John from heaven at the Mount of Transfiguration, 
2 Peter 1, verses 17 to 18 tell us. Despite the fact that God spoke to Hagar from heaven, Genesis 21, verse 17, what aileth thee, Hagar? Um, why would someone think that the wording was only figurative or devotional when there are numerous examples throughout the scripture where God spoke uh, from heaven to somebody for somebody's uh, attention? Notice there's a semicolon at the end of verse 25. Uh, verses 25 and 26 go together. So when will the voice of Jesus Christ, the voice of God, speak from heaven and shake both heaven and earth? That's a good question. You know, there are 31,102 verses in the King James Bible. 31,102 verses in the King James Bible. Imagine working a jigsaw puzzle with 31,102 pieces. <laughs> um, only after carefully fitting several of them together can you get an idea of what that picture is turning into. How many ever worked one? Not that many pieces, obviously, but you put a few pieces together and, oh, that's a barn. That's a, that's a horse and that. You might not have all the pieces, but you have an idea of where it's going. And so it is many times when we're trying to study the Word of God. You compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. That's the best way. That's the most direct approach. Revelation 12, verse 17. Go, go over there if you will. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, and verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Also, look at Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Well, in chapter 12, the woman is Israel. Those will be the Jews in the tribulation. Chapter 14, the context of the preceding verses show that these are Gentiles in the tribulation. And they're closely connected with verses 6 and 7 there, chapter 14. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. By the way, verse 6 there says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, about verse, uh, verses 7 or 8, If any man preach, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. Here is an angel preaching from heaven, preaching a different gospel than the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's not accursed. The idea that all men are saved in all ages the same way is nonsense. Amen. 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 Let me ask you. I'm, this is, I wasn't planning to say this, but let me ask you a couple of questions. These aren't intended to be trick questions, but raise your hand if you know when the Old Testament began. Yes, sir. After Christ was uh, buried and rose again. Old Testament. Old Testament. When did the Old Testament begin? Old Testament. The, the, the knee jerk answer well, it's the book of Genesis. That's the first book in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament or the Old Covenant began uh, Exodus 20 at Mount Sinai, the giving of the law. When did the New Testament begin? My brother hinted at it. <laughs> yes, sir. It began when uh, John pointed out Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And Jesus came saying, Verily, verily. You're getting close to I it. I tell you the truth. You're getting close to it, Brother Ron. But... Um, when Jesus was here on the earth, and he had 12 apostles with him, and he preached to the nation of Israel, he was still living in Old Testament times, technically. They were still in Old Testament times before 
his death, burial, and resurrection following Calvary and his resurrection from the tomb. Prior to that, they were in the Old Testament. So you can't go to the first chapter of Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, and say that's where the New Testament, that's where the books of the New Testament begin. But, but even Luke chapter 1 says that John the Baptist was born six months before Christ was born. And it says about his parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, that they were both righteous. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's how a person's righteousness was measured and established before the coming of the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross of Calvary. And salvation by grace. A person's righteousness was established based upon their degree of obedience to what had been revealed up to that point. So the, New, the Old Testament began, and the lights are flickering, the rapture is taking place now. <laughs> the Old Testament began at the giving of the law, Mount Sinai, it didn't end until the, the uh, death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, right. and then the New Testament began. So you can throw that question at somebody else, trick somebody else with that. But... Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, Moses told the Jews, It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. We'll do exactly what we're told to do, and it will result in our righteousness. And the Apostle Paul says, Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us Amen. by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner who turns to God by Jesus Christ. Amen. It has nothing to do with your effort or anything you could accomplish or do on your own. Amen. It has everything to do with you trusting what Jesus Christ already did for you. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Amen. if you don't see that there's a difference between those two messages, then naturally you're not going to see that the angel preaches what's called the everlasting gospel, telling people to worship God who made heaven and earth and the seas, and he says not a single word about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, and the two verses we read, uh, Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12, say that the people are saved at that time by keeping the commandments of God and having the faith or testimony of Jesus Christ. If before the Lord Jesus Christ, men were saved by keeping the law and the commandments, and since the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are saved by grace through faith, apart from our own efforts, doesn't it make some sense that the next period of time, God will test men based on both things? How much faith, how much works, I can't say. I'm not planning to be here. <laughs> but uh, I promise you that's exactly... The Apostle Paul says, um, you know, are justified by grace uh, without, the sh without the deeds of the law. And then James says, without, your faith without works is dead. Yes, so those books set up contradictions in the Bible. The only way to understand it is that it's going to have to apply sometime Amen. where faith and works are coupled together. Amen. All right. <clears throat> As the everlasting gospel is being preached, the Hebrews are warned of an impending uh, advent or the judgment. Look at chapter 14, Revelation 14, I should say, and the verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. <clears throat> and also go back to James chapter 5. I may be going more quickly than long, but that's all right. Try to turn quickly or just write them down. James 5, verses 7 to 9. James chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, 
lest he be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. We'll go back, if you will, to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11. And let me start there at verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto the, a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with, an, with all plagues as often as they will. These are clearly Moses and Elijah showing up once again. <clears throat> they show up once again before the visible, literal kingdom of Jesus Christ begins here on the earth. Moses turned water into blood, Exodus 7. Elijah called fire down from heaven on his enemy, 2 Kings chapter 1. Elijah commanded that no rain should fall for uh, three years, 1 Kings 17. And they both are anticipated by the prophet Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, they both appear with Jesus Christ when he was transfigured before his apostles, Matthew 17, in a sort of a, a preview of coming attractions. And so to supplement their preaching and the testimonies of 144,000 at that time, there is going to be one final, literal, physical, visible appearance of Jesus Christ from heaven before his second advent begins. Revelation 14 and verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. When he does, <clears throat> he says something to somebody. And at the time he says something, and he says it from heaven. He speaketh from heaven, according to our text. Uh, consider Paul's experience. Go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. There the Lord Jesus Christ spoke from heaven to somebody he wanted, uh, whose attention he wanted. Back to our uh, text, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. You know, you know, among the unshakable things is the kingdom. Verse 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. For the believer in the New Testament church, the body of Jesus Christ, there are several things that are unshakable. Uh, the love of God is unshakable. Neither height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Paul says, Romans chapter 8. Our salvation is unshakable. I don't do the saving. God does the saving. Amen. Therefore, I can't do the keeping. I have to trust Him to do the keeping. Amen. If God really wants me to get to heaven, He's going to have to do the keeping as well. 
<laughs> I don't fully understand everything that was done when I was born again. So how can I then be responsible to maintain it all? Yeah. Think about it that way. Mm -hmm. Our heavenly home is unshakable. The mercy of God. Amen. Amen. It's unshakable. The grace of God is unshakable. Think about all the things that God's forgiven you of time and time again. When you didn't deserve it, give you a chance to serve him once more. Bet you live to see a new day when he should have struck you dead yesterday. And um, the integrity of God is always unshakable. As I mentioned in church hour, nobody can accuse God of being unjust or unfair in his treatment or dealings with anybody. As often as I've, I've said this, I'll say it again. No matter how bad your circumstances may be, there is always someone whose circumstances are far worse. Yeah. Be thankful Amen. for problems you don't have. Amen. Amen. Right. Look at it that way. That's right. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Right. Romans 3 verse 4 says, His words are unshakable. Amen. You can always depend on them. Amen. Amen. I said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Amen. And then... Um, that word kingdom, verse 28, has three possible applications. Number one, it's a reference to a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, that you entered into when you were born again. Mm -hmm. Romans 14, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, those are physical things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Those are spirit. Yes. That's what the kingdom of God is. Or secondly, it can be a reference to the millennial kingdom, 1,000 years. That's what we call the kingdom of heaven, which is the subject of the book of Hebrews, to be quite frank. Or thirdly, it can be a reference to an eternal kingdom after the 1,000 years are over. But the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about that. Eternity future, as it's sometimes called. And uh, after that 1,000 years, you and I will continue to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, verse 5 states, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. That's beyond the 1,000 years. Verse 28 continues, well, I take that back. Let me back up a little bit here. You know, nearly every commentator applies this to the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom of God only. And um, I'm the New Testament believer. They said, can't seem to get their minds off of any other subject except that the Christian is saved right now. His sins have been forgiven. His name's in the book of life. And one day he's going to be changed to be like the glorified body of the Son of God. That's mm -hmm. as far as they can think. They can't yeah. think beyond that. Right. But verse, by the way, why would it be that a book written to Hebrews, titled the book of Hebrews, <laughs> would put so much emphasis on the New Testament church, which is mostly made up of Gentiles? Yeah. Why would that be? Why should that be? Verse 28 continues, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The regenerated believer has his name in heaven. He's seated in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. Mm -hmm. um, the continuous indwelling of the Holy Ghost, he has that. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, he has that. The forgiveness of all his past sins and eternal security, the promise of a glorified body like Jesus Christ, this is before he does anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an amazing uh, blessing to think of all that God gives to the sinner before the sinner has ever done squat for the Lord Jesus. Hey. <laughs> he hasn't served him, hasn't witnessed, hasn't passed out of drive, hasn't invited anyone to church, hasn't talked to his unsaved friends and loved ones, hasn't lived for Christ at work, hasn't talked about Christ at school, hasn't done anything for the Lord Jesus yet. And yet he's got all of those things waiting for him. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. So I mentioned a week or so ago, um, to have the nicest mansion here on the earth with all the money you could possibly want is nothing compared to being part owner of the universe one day. <laughs> but it can't just be a spiritual kingdom. Go, if you will, back to Acts chapter 1. We enter the kingdom of God by faith. The moment we trust Christ to be our Savior, we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, save our souls. When the Lord Jesus comes back, He will establish a literal earthly reign over planet Earth and govern this world the way it should have always been governed, the way men and their governments have messed things up. He'll set things right once again. And it'll be an absolute monarchical rule by a righteous king governing planet Earth and the universe by extension. Acts chapter 1, and uh, verses 5 and 6. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So the idea of the Jew receiving a, a kingdom where the nation of the of Jews was once again in prominence and the rest of the world coming to them to worship the Lord, the Lord God wasn't done away with. It was still fresh in their minds. Christ hadn't erased that thought in three and a half years of preaching to them. Walking with him day by day, and listening to him preach, the idea that the Jew would receive his kingdom was still in their minds. And Lord Jesus said there, verse 7, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. He didn't say no, which the Father hath put in his own power. But what's, what's going to happen first, what's most important, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. What's, gonna, what's taking place first is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, the literal, absolute, physical, visible, um, absolute, literal kingdom of Jesus Christ reigning over the world and all of its affairs is yet to come. That's the kingdom of heaven. The words God and heaven are two different words, so we don't want to confuse those with each other. They're not simply synonyms. They don't mean the same thing. One means God, spiritual. The other means heaven, physical. Um, Christ said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He talked about all these things the Gentiles seek after. He says, And all these things shall be added unto you. There's a distinction between the, the uh, realm, spiritual realm and the realm of physical objects. Physical domain and the governing of the world. And then the last verse... Hebrews 12, verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. I think we briefly mentioned that a couple weeks ago, but I, I thought, as I was preparing earlier, just in case you run into a Jehovah's Witness that says, you know, the word hell isn't anywhere in the Bible. They want to run to Hades or Sheol or Gehenna. They want to talk about some word that it was translated wrongly. It should be Hades or it should be any number of other things. Here's how you talk to Go back to Psalm 21. I might write these down as we're going. Psalm 21. Psalm 21, verse 9. Oh, let's see, verses 8 and 9. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. This is prophetic. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Lord Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation. Let me see your hands. Who's got a mark? Who didn't have a mark? Verse 9, Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven. In the time of thine anger, the Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Go forward to Malachi, 
chapter 4. Malachi, or Malachi, those of you from Italy. <laughs> Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. All the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Go forward to the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of excuse me in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here's what you want to tell the JW. Those people with the little carts, you know, the little rack. They used to stand in front of stores holding the magazine. Now the, the, that gets to hurt their arm. You know, so now we have the rack that holds the magazines for us. God's wrath is described as an oven. It's described as fire. It's described as uh, fire and brimstone, and it's described as torment. And it's called the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. The word hell doesn't occur in any of those verses. How else would you describe God's judgment, God's punishment of sinners and judgment on sin? You couldn't call it hell. What else are you going to call it? <laughs> Hades. And, yeah. You know, the Japanese dropped leaflets in Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941. Some of those leaflets said, you Yankees, you go to hell. It didn't say, you go to Hades. <laughs> it didn't say, go to Sheol, like the new ASV and the new modern Bible say. It said, you go to hell. Everybody knows what hell means. That's what, the reason they want to change is because they don't like the place they're going to. They're going there and they don't want to, re, they don't want it. They want to reword it. If I can reword it, then maybe I'll be exempt from it. You're not. 